Good morning, uh, Louise. I'm I'm thrilled and excited and, and appreciative of you participating in our leadership series. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, I think the best way to start, this is our leadership series, would be if you could just um, tell our audience, you know, who you are and a little bit about your background. Okay, so I am Louise Wanier. I am an experienced uh, CEO, leader, and entrepreneur. I have built a number of companies and I have chaired and uh, been in executive roles on board of directors for some time now. I've worked in four different industries. I've worked in education technology and consumer electronics. I worked earlier in my career in healthcare. I've worked in software development and I've worked in building a fashion e-commerce company. And what have you done in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've raised four kids. I've got four adult children. I have a passion for cycling. I love to travel extensively, and I also donate a certain amount of time to nonprofit boards at this time. That's awesome. Uh, we want to have the discussion now, but I don't know if I ever told you I used to own a professional cycling team. You're kidding. You I didn't tell me that. I didn't. You got to save some. Got to save some. We'll talk about that. It was called the Miami Wave. It was part of the National Cycling League, and. Uh, That'll be good for another video interview or discussion, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> but tell, would... tell me, um, you know, this is the leadership series. I'm going to start right off with a simple question, but it, it generally takes a longer answer. But briefly, what would be your definition of leadership? You know, I actually love and hate that question because <laughs> it's in, in one sense, it's a very gen general question. And for me, leadership is specific to the situation. Mm -hmm. That is, it depends what type of leadership you bring depends on the type of problem or the type of opportunity that one is trying to grow. Mm -hmm. So it's contextual. It's based on the circumstances. I think the most challenging leadership situations that I've been in have been ones where I've had to lead from not being in the quote leadership position but where I was a member of a team and I needed to both contribute my expertise and also try to help guide the team towards a process to an outcome that would produce a result that was needed for that organization. Um, if you want to ask me in more detail about that, I'd be happy to go into the details. Well, that's but actually I, very I, wise I, because uh, a, a partner of Deloitte & Touche years ago, multiple years ago, um, mm. told me, um, you know, if you want to be a partner, the time to act like a partner is before you're a partner. Exactly. I think I was given the same advice when I was a junior consultant at Ernst. They said, if you want to be a senior manager, you need to start behaving in the role of senior manager before you get there. And then once you're a senior manager, you need to start behaving as a partner before you get to be partner. So I, I think we were given similar experience in our um, nascent careers. I guess. That was big eight era, right? At least for me, it was. <laughs> You're never supposed to ask a woman how old she is. But I didn't. As, I didn't. <laughs> I know. I know. But I graduated from business school in 1980. So. I'm before you. So let me ask you a question. Um, astronomy. I find that fascinating. You started out studying astronomy, and then you went into management and finance. How did you evolve? How did that happen? First of all, how did you evolve to the opportunities to those opportunities early in your career? Well, I get this question a lot because there aren't very many people who have a Bachelor of Science in Astronomy, a Master's, an MBA from UCLA, and a degree in textile design from the Fashion Institute in Los Angeles. Um, but what happened to me is that as an undergraduate at Caltech, I did research sufficiently during my summer months to realize that I wasn't a sit in the basement and just do research person. I really loved people and I loved the real world a lot and some of my fellow students at Caltech were also applying to business school after they finished their undergraduate degree and I applied to UCLA and they were one of the few business schools that was willing to take someone in with limited business experience at that time. I went into the MBA program and I found that I went from having my head absolutely hurt to having my head absolutely explode with delight because I I found I was in my world. I was in the world of business and ideas and people and putting projects together and understanding how the world worked. And, and so that was the transition for me. And from there, I started in management consulting because I didn't have a particular industry focus and I wanted to work in an organization that would give me exposure to the different aspects of business so that I could then grow those skills that would be needed to then either um, continue to lead businesses or work in businesses. 
No, it's 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 fascinating. I, I I'm trying to it's very hard not to uh, not to use the expression you you were one that wanted to reach for the stars, but I had to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> Now you have been a strategic executive, as you said, in, in diverse industries. And <clears throat> what I want to know is, how does an executive, in your opinion, obviously, in a corporate or an entrepreneurial scenario, how do you feel as an executive can create a winning culture, and for that matter, even lead in different strategies and different stages of a growing company? Well, I think that it does take a different kind of leadership at each stage of a growing company. I saw a presentation, uh, well, several times over, and I've read a number of uh, books on the topic as well. But in my experience, it takes a very different type of leadership when you're at the zero to, say, 10 million in revenue, or the 10 million to 100 million in revenue, or the 100 million you know, up to the billion dollar level of revenue. All of those stages I've had some experience with, but the the... The bulk of my experience has been in the zero to 100 range of revenues. And I think that the, the leadership changes in the following way. You start by having to be completely hands-on and understanding every aspect of the business to then moving to a phase where you have to excel at two things. You have to excel at bringing the right people on who know the pieces that you don't know to lead the parts of the business that are needed in order to grow and scale the business. And you have to excel at being able to recruit the right advisors and the right board and the right systems and the right processes in order to build that. And then I joined an organization called, um, it's now called Vistage, it was called Tech at the time, mm -hmm. to continue my own professional development. So I was within a group of 10 to 15 CEO executives for a period of 10 years where we had constant speakers on all the topics which are in common amongst growing businesses. So everything from board development to strategic planning to sales management to financial engineering to, um, you know, the, the very human resources. I mean, the one thing that all businesses have in common is the need to have the right people in the right place at the right time. And those skills become more and more important as the business scales. I, I, I agree. Obviously, from my perspective, executive search, we talk about the right fit all the time. Um, we also know that, you know, you can create an all-star, a bunch, you can bring in a bunch of all-stars together, but it doesn't necessarily create a winning culture or a consistently winning team. What's your experiences in creating the right culture when you, when you are, especially in a zero to $100 million company where every person makes a bigger impact than if they were in a $10 billion company where it could be missed? Well, I think my best experience has come, the hardest thing to do in that kind of a fast growing company where you're, you're fighting fires a lot of the day and you feel like you have no time at all to think right. is to actually force yourself to do the important but not the urgent, to borrow words from, from uh, Stephen Covey's book, excuse me, but is to actually do the planning. So the most useful tool I found to, is, is to do collaborative planning where you build the ownership and alignment around the strategic plan and around the tactical plans that support the strategic plan each quarter and each month consistently in the business. And by taking the time to do both um, team meetings with your senior team, as well as enforcing a culture, and I don't mean in a regimental way, but right. encouraging a culture where they in turn do it with their teams and where you also create a 360 feedback loop in the leadership and where you also have non-identifiable but voluntary feedback in that you publicly expose. So I used to run a team meeting every week with the entire company up until the time we got to more than 100 people in the company where we would have an all hands meeting once a week where once a week we would go through the metrics of the company. We would go through the key uh, objectives for the business for the coming week. And then as the business progressed, that would then become once a month. And in turn, the different teams would be doing it with their teams each week. We would have an open doors policy so people would always come in, you know, with whatever question that they had. I just believed that you have to have open information and open metrics. And every person has got to understand exactly how they contribute to the team. So it's really taking the time to have the discussions, to answer the questions, and to put the plans in place and then to measure against the plans to see how you're progressing and how you're proceeding. And I know that's a, just a completely general answer. And of course, the specifics are so different in every single business. Well, they're different, but but they all have the basic. If you have the foundation, um, that's the key, because otherwise it crumbles into that. You know, a word that we use with a lot of our clients, um, 
that's important is trust, trust between the people that you're that you're working with on the team. Um, exactly. and I compare a lot of things to sports. And, you know, athletes talk about trust in the sense of um, the player knows where that other player is and trust where that other player is going to be on the field or on the ice at a specific time. Trust that they're going to support them if they make a mistake, different things like that. I think trust plays a big part of it. I think trust is enormous. And trust is not something you can talk about. It's something you have to behave about, if you right. will. So trust gets built through our actions. I, it gets, I see. It, it, it they, gets built by being open and having that openness be true. Having it be that the things that you say in those meetings are actually the truth of what's going on in the organization. I've been in organizations where that was not the case, and those organizations usually ended up failing. Yeah, One, and I've seen it uh, in many of those too, whether it's a business business team or, or, a, or a sports team. Um, you know, people I've talked to and both say, you know, one thing they look for, they like to win the championship every year if they could, but they know they won't. But one thing they absolutely want is a winning season every year. And um, and the only way to do that is to have trusted teammates. And I think that that's also about being straight about expectations and being straight about results. Right. I have a, an old business mentor who's one of my, um, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. His name is Ren Zafiropoulos. And he built Versatec into a $200 million division of Xerox Corporation. After selling it to them when it was at the $10 million level, he then stayed on. And he was the only corporate VP who was able to negotiate a separate compensation and bonus structure for his division from the rest of Xerox Corporation. Wow. And what I learned from him was, um, you know, some, I, I just learned a tremendous amount just being in his presence. But one of the things he used to say was that how you feel about how you're doing has to do with the actual compared to the expected. And sometimes the art of it is in working with a team and leading a team using the right type of expectations. You can use expectations that are completely unachievable and all you do is demoralize the team. You can use expectations that are achievable but a stretch and you can incite people to achieve things they never believed were possible. And it's how to stage those expectations and how to also hear them from the people on the team. I don't believe as a leader that you have all the answers. I believe your job is to facilitate the team achieving with the different people on the team having the different pieces what is achievable. No, I, th I think that's brilliant. You know, if, uh, if, if, if a leader of a company says we're going to acquire a company that's, you know, 10 times our size or the coach of a sports team says, yeah, we're going to win the championship, but everybody knows on the team knows that's ridiculous. Um, rather than the coach saying, well, let's win tomorrow's game first and then we'll see, so to speak. You know, um, you have to have some credibility in your leadership in your leadership as well. I, I wanted to ask you a question. Can I interject there for just one second? Absolutely. Because I think there's something from my background that, that is interesting there and that I watched just what you're saying happen. Mm -hmm. the, one of the first companies, I, the second company I built was Gemstar, and we built that to... Um, revenue in the hundreds of millions and then took it public for a market cap of 500 million. I left the company shortly before it went public, mm -hmm. but I was still a major owner of the company. At that time, it built from a 500 market cap to a 20 billion market cap, which was at the end of the 90s and it was the time when the market was going up. That enabled the company as a, as a really a, uh, excuse me, a David in the terms of revenue to acquire the behemoth Goliath TV guide and they became Gemstar TV Guide International. Mm -hmm. And then I watched that company completely falter because the, they didn't shift their organization with the acquisition. And as a result, that leadership team lost complete control, made some very poor decisions trying to hold it together and didn't understand the transition that was gonna be needed to move from a fast paced technology company to a very large scale organization that was the combination and probably not a well thought out combination similar to the AOL um, uh, fiasco with the right. merger with Time Warner. But yeah, th those, those um, leadership scenarios are, are exactly as, as you've indicated, very challenging. Yeah, and it's, gotta, it's definitely gotta be thought out to do it properly and, and you gotta always realize that you're dealing with people which uh, mm -hmm. is, is a big variable. Um, a little, yes. a little, si little sideline here is, do you use any of your, your accomplishments or strategies from your, your, your global cycling and your artistry and all that <laughs> in business? I do. I think the most important thing that I use there is 
it, it's really my self work. It's what it's done for me is help me to build a space between taking the input and choosing the action. So I'm by nature a very um, spontaneous, highly energetic, highly passionate, you know, in there doing kind of person. And it's helped to give me a bit more space and a bit more thoughtfulness in response to receiving the input. And to also notice what my natural, um, it's given me a greater understanding of my own natural temperament so that I'm able to also, when I'm working with other people in a leadership capacity, see and, and feel their natural temperament. Because in, in this situational leadership, it helps you to then understand how different people need different environments in order to and to create that environment. I think your biggest job as a leader is to create that environment for success for your team and for the different pieces of the team. And so in, in doing this cycling and observing other cyclists and my own reaction to the cycling and to the challenge, I've also learned something very important about myself. My nature is to be by nature very on and then back and then on and then back. Mm -hmm. But during a really high stress situation, which is the nature of that cycling, I've learned how to shift that to being a very consistent paced, non-extreme, but consistently forward person. And, and so I've, it's given me, it's given me the ability to learn how to pace and train and manage my own energies. Yeah, and I, th I think that's brilliant. And um, I've noticed that with a lot of athletes that have gone into business. And I think it's a it's a great a great way to evaluate it and, and see how to be a good leader and teammate, obviously, at the, at the same time. If we move on to boards, you mentioned boards before. Um, yeah. Boards have obviously valued leaders, again, if it's the right fit. You know, what's your perspective on what an effective board looks like? And for that matter, how you would be the right fit on a board? Thank you. Well, I think that a, a, the right board, again, is very contextually. Um, it, it depends on the circumstances of the company. Sure. But, it, but in general, I would say that a good board needs to have a mirror of talent, which mirrors the talent that's needed to have the business succeed. And it needs some specific industry expertise, some particularly for strategic and for industry outreach. It needs, and for comparable experience that can help advise the operating CEO. It, it needs some people that are disciplined as in the financial discipline and the financial management and the, um, the, the board oversight and board diligence that is required, particularly in, in today's world um, um, mm -hmm. with the new financial and accounting regulations. Sure. And it needs people who have been in similar leadership circumstances, similar marketing circumstances, similar organizational development circumstances who can lend their expertise and strategic acumen uh, to the board. I think what I bring is a very creative breadth of discourse around a lot of topics in the building blocks of growth for an organization. But as I said, between the zero and 100 million range and uh, that's where most of my experience has been. And I think that I, that I bring um, a very solid strategic acumen to dealing with complex problems and to working as a member of the team with the rest of the board in organizing and discussing in a serious way the different business challenges um, that go. So I have some content to offer and some business process or some decision-making process strategic acumen to offer, which I think is um, potentially of value to a number of boards. No, it's, it's definitely of value. And it's, it's interesting, I had, a, I had an online conversation, if you will, with the CEO of eBay a while back, and he said, you know, we, um, we, need, to be, we need to step back and be more creative and thinking a little bit because we're always busy. And he said he specifically right. takes time to do that. And creative right. was more than just creating it was actually letting things create themselves in your mind to some exactly, degree. Exactly, exactly. Almost so like I, when you were a kid, just letting things evolve. I mean, I think that um, one of the ways I have contributed to the boards I've been on, I mean, the boards that I've been on, I have both formed those boards and been on boards. Um, so I've, I've both joined a board in a, in a leadership role and I have helped form boards and helped form advisory boards. And so when I formed those boards, I've looked at what mix of skills do I need to bring together for that board. And 
when I formed the advisory boards, I've principally been looking at what industry expertise we needed. Mm -hmm. But I think that the other role on the board is then, and, and where I've contributed significantly, is to help the board as a whole develop processes by which it can accomplish those strategic and difficult decision-making analyses that it needs to do. And as a result, obviously, support the CEO and the whole business overall. Exactly. Um, that's, well, that's our job. Our job is to provide right. an oversight function and to provide a support function to accomplishing the objectives on behalf of the shareholders. Exactly. So I have some personal questions now. Um, very oh, personal okay. questions. Um, okay. Not really that personal, but uh, do you have a pet? Do I have a pet? I don't have a pet. No, oh, okay. Well, I got three dogs. I, I don't can. have a pet. I can I, but my, I should say that my 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 passion is 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 really people and um, and then physical passions such as um, cycling and I used to be a great dancer. I haven't gone out dancing quite as much recently, but I love folk dancing and modern dancing. Well, that answers one of my next questions. Then, do you have a favorite um, movie and or TV show? I like the um, Good Wife tremendously, and also Commander in Chief, and also Madam Secretary. I am with you. I love Madam Secretary, and if Tia Leone is listening, you're the best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tia Leone, please, please. <laughs> yes. How about music? Any favorite music? I love all kinds of classical music, all kinds of folk music, all kinds of uh, jazz, Cuban music, rock. I'm pretty broad in my musical talent. I played the piano for a number of years, and I do sing in an amateur basis with a local. We heard. I, I did sing locally with an amateur group. I'm looking for a new group now to get involved with. Cool. What about food? Any particular food you like best? Um, healthy food. <laughs> Not very good. Not as. I mean, I love ice cream. It doesn't love me though. <laughs> it loves you eating it. Hey, listen. Thank you so much for. Um, participating. It's been delightful uh, speaking with you and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much, Mark.